Welcome to Ray Presents today. I'm super happy to speak to a friend of mine, Jacoda. How you doing, brother? Yo, we're 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 good, man. We're positive. We're we're doing what we got to do, and we're staying on the grind, man. Yes, my Afro Indigenous artist, <laughs> entrepreneur. Tell me, tell me your story and how you got started into the music and all the wonderful things that you're doing. Man, first of all, I want to just uh, thank you for this invitation. Uh, you know, we've known each other for for many years now, playing yeah. basketball back in the day. You know, crossing paths in the jewelry store and just making a, a brother to brother connection. And I really believe in in synchronicity. I really believe in the vibrations of the universe. And so I don't think it's an accident that we've crossed paths and just naturally connected. There's a reason for it. And uh, I'm really appreciated that uh, you've invited me to be here. So I just want to give thanks and appreciation and gratitude for the invitation. So thank you, Ray. For oh, real. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate it. Listen, you know, you're always someone, you've always been someone I, I admire, the work that you've been doing uh, when you were in Ottawa, you're in Saskatchewan right now for, for, for the viewers. You know, tell them what, you, what you're doing in Saskatchewan right now when inspired the, the move from, from Ottawa to, uh, to Saskatchewan. Sure, sure. So, Chandewa Shte Nam Bechim Nuzinkta, I've been on a learning journey. I come to you in a good way with a good heart. Huhu Jubina Enwa Ti. Oshamano Yadejadahawahi. I'm from Oshaman First Nation. I was born and raised in Winnipeg. To make a long story short, we can get into as many details as you want. But go for it. Go for it. You know, my uh, my parents split when I was fairly young, and uh, ended up rebelling and moving out on my own and getting street involved and really just trying to you know take care of myself and my responsibilities, trying to find myself as a man. And uh, my mother ended up uh, moving and living with her husband uh, in Quebec, so uh, the Algonquin Territory, just over, uh, you know, uh, Ottawa, that Ottawa Bridge. Um, in uh, So Ottawa and Elmer really living in that region. And I took it as an opportunity to start over. You know, I, I hit rock bottom. I was doing things I wasn't proud of. You know, I became a, an uncle. I felt as a young age, I always thought uncles were older guys. You know what I'm saying? I was like, how am I an uncle? I'm in my 20s, you know, but but no, that really changed my life. And so I wanted to do better, be better. And so I, I changed my environment. I, I took a leap, moved moved in with my mom, stacked as much money as I could, bought a condo right away. And, uh, you know, again, started that journey on living on my own. But trying to find a way to develop myself as a professional. I've gone through my own personal lived experiences, uh, you know, learning about my indigenous history, uh, learning from my father what it means to be a man of color and uh, how I'm going to have to navigate society in order to survive, in order to thrive. And, and my dad always instilled in me hard work, uh, work ethic, I've always been inspired by my mother. You know, she went from a barefoot uh, native on the res to moving into Ottawa to climbing up the government ladder. And now she's in a director position. And so I've always admired my mother, you know, consistently going to school, getting educated no matter what age she was. And I think having those things in the backdrop, my hardworking father, uh, my my hardworking mother is where I think I've I've inherited some of those traits and really just trying to make my family proud. And so uh, I moved to Ottawa to reset and, uh, you know, tried a few things. My music career started going in a particular direction. I really found a passion working with young people. So I ended up working as a youth diversion coordinator with young people in conflict with the law. And that was kind of my transition from working at a jewelry store to working uh, in a more of a professional, different type of professional environment where I cross paths with Ray. And so, yeah, it's been a journey, man. It's it's uh, it's not never a straight line. Let, let's say that. And, uh, you know, I have no regrets. Mistakes are probably my favorite teachers that I've had in my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, fast forwarding, living in Ottawa for 10, 11 years of my life and trying to build myself up professionally, stack up my resume. I found myself working for uh, Futurepreneur, which is an entrepreneurship organization. 
helping them with startups and uh, getting access to capital so they can get their business going. And, um, you know, I really love that position. I really loved being in that, that seat to help other people manifest their dreams. Cause I feel like I've already done that in some capacities. So mm -hmm. I really just want to help other people do the same. And I found myself questioning my own integrity in regards to my structure of thinking or my exposure to education in regards to making sure I'm helping them in the best way possible. Let me interject in my story. I never finished university after high school. Mm -hmm. I finished high school two years late. So I never was an academic, but I've climbed up the professional ladder and I've made up to upwards to 70,000 a year in my 20s working for an organization as a director. And I just feel as though I was more passionate about work experience than I was academics because of my indigenous rationale and my indigenous understanding of the indoctrination process and colonial constructs. Mm -hmm. so I've always had a rebellious type of spirit about me. And so I ended up to catch us back up on this, this long winded, windy roaded story here. No, uh, go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but you know, living in Ottawa and getting this job, working with young people, young entrepreneurs, I wanted to level up my education. And my grandmother was the first Nakota language teacher at the First Nation University of Canada in Regina. And so I've always wanted to take that class. It just was never in a state of my life where the opportunity presented itself. Mm -hmm. And so when I started questioning, you know, my own abilities and just wanting to give them the best and do more for, for others, I decided to leave that career, which was one of my highest paying jobs to level up my education and I moved to Regina, sold everything, started over. I have some family members here, but they don't live in the city. They live on the, in my community. So I don't even have friends here. I just wanted to take a leap and take an opportunity to really uh, be better and do better. And so I'm here now in uh, Regina at the First Nation University in my last year of my school. Uh, I just finished a certificate in Indigenous Economic Development, and I'm just uh, finishing uh, a business administration. That's amazing. So, yeah, we just grounded out here trying to level up and do our part, man. Hey, as always, as always. But speaking, yeah. you, you spoke about your dad earlier, you know? Yeah. Can you tell me, you know, being an Afro-Indigenous, <laughs> you know, having an Afro-Indigenous background, that, that's, that's, that's amazing. Can you tell me, you know, your roots are both in Kingston, Jamaica, and uh, obviously the Nakoda Assiniboine heritage. Can you yes. tell me, you know, how has it influenced your your, your artistic uh, expression as an entrepreneur and as a you know as an artist? In all ways, in all ways. Um, I'm trying to remember the time I was probably like 17 when we went to Jamaica for the first time. You know, and. Uh, being there so at that age i don't think i fully comprehended the value of it and so it was an experience that i'll never forget it was the last time my family was all together as a unit you mm -hmm. know so there's that sentimental value but growing up younger than that you know i can remember being like 13 12 my dad sat me down and made sure I was aware that I'm a man of color. And he instilled in me the value that I'm going to have to work twice as hard as everybody else to, to succeed in society because of that. So I've always carried that uh, throughout my childhood. I got involved in sports, um, but it wasn't until I, I moved. Um, it wasn't until I was I moved out that I really started doing music. So I have a brother on my dad's side who also came from Kingston, Jamaica, uh, when my dad moved to, to Canada in uh, 1975. And so it was cool to be Jamaican in that time frame because we know how to throw a party. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we know how to throw a party. So my dad DJed and my dad was in a band. 
So I have vivid memories of going into the garage and hearing reggae music, going down into the basement, seeing turntables and records all over the place. Um, and then my brother would visit every now and then, and he was a DJ. So I got memories of my brother sneaking me into the club underage, underneath the DJ table and passing him the records. Yo, find me the Red Man record. Yo, here you go. Find me the 50 Cent record. Yo, here you go. You know what I'm saying? So music from my dad's side was something I was born into. It was something I was born into. And then when I, when I moved out, um, I needed an outlet to channel all of my my internal thoughts and my anger and my frustrations and the chips that I had on my shoulder could fill a Lay's chips bag. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's crazy. So I really needed an outlet and uh, I started using music. And at first it was, it was me just trying to find my coolness uh, and then it started being uh, my story, my truth, the things that I experienced um, living in the in the street life and encountering gang violence and overcoming those type of things and having my friend stabbed in front of me, having a gun pulled on me point blank, you know, having friends, you know, dying in the street life due to to addictions and, and overdoses and man, my just all these different things were, were building up on top of my own frustrations of my parents divorcing. Mm -hmm. So music became my, my therapy. It really did. And I got to a point where I was self-medicating and, and self-deprecating myself just because I was trying to find my way. And, and a lot of things didn't make sense. And I was really angry and didn't believe in a God or nothing like that. And so I had a roommate, he's from Nigeria and um, he moved to Canada to go to school. And, and my brother brotherhood I had with him changed my life. And he was a church going man. And so I was the one with the whip. So I would drop him off at church and have to pick him up every Sunday, sometimes twice a week, Saturday, drop him off so he could practice choir. And um, one day he's like, man, you might as well just stay. You got to pick me up anyways. Why don't you just stay? I'm like, man, I'm not about this church thing. It's like, you got to just pick me up. Just hang out. I'm like, all right, I'll hang out because you're in the choir, man. I'll, I'll, I'll stay for the music, right? So I started, you know, attending church with him and, and uh, it just became a regular thing. And the pastor asked me one day, because I think he spoke to the pastor to try to get me more involved somehow. And the <laughs> pastor asked me, yo, do you, do you want to be part of the choir? I'm like, listen, man, I don't have a lot of vocals like that, but, <laughs> but I'm willing to perform a rap song if you want. So they're like, cool. I'm like, all right, sweet. So I go home that evening. I make my own beat. And this is what I did. I opened the Bible for the first time. And I'm just looking for verses to make references so I can connect with the audience at the same time, tell my story and tell my truth. So I started putting this whole song together. And for my first live performance was in a church. Wow. Crazy. So I do this, this performance. I rap this song that was basically me talking about rock bottom and trying to build myself back up and all these things. I finish performing and I get a standing ovation from the congregation first performance. So that touched my spirit. It penetrated my physical body and touched my spirit. And I felt a relationship with God for the first time where God was telling me, this is what I need to do is, use music as a way to tell my story and share my truth. So I haven't put the mic down since. So I would say, you know, my, my upbringing of my dad being in a band, being a DJ, my brother being a DJ, uh, my relative who's still my, my, or my roommate who's still my close friend today, um, you know, inviting me into the church to hang out with him during the choir and then having my first performance um, really was me 
uh, falling in love with music as an outlet, as a form of therapy. And uh, man, I'll share one more tail end of this story here. I ended up recording like with headphones. I'm talking like like gaming headphones with a mic, like not even a real microphone. And I created like mixtapes. I would just download uh, instrumentals from the internet you know, from Bear Share or from freaking LimeWire, for those who know what I'm Lime talking about. LimeWire. <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> and that was back in the day when you used, when cell phones just came out and you needed to put a voicemail. And so I would always rap and rhyme my voicemail over an instrumental. And so anyways, I started making all these mixtapes and just handing them out for free. And this one kid at, at the school I was going to, he came up to me, he's like, man, you're, your music really changed my 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 life, my outlook on things. And I'm like, how so? It's just like the way that you you talking about things in your songs just make me look at things differently. And so that was when I started realizing my music can have an impact on strangers. And mm -hmm. so it was just a motivating factor. I started doing more of it. And uh, so it was things like that that slowly progressed me feeling um, that this was a sense of purpose that that this was a God given, uh, you know, this was a gift that creator blessed me with to use as a form of therapy, not only to help myself, but, you know, to help and help in others. others. Yeah, that's exactly. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing that story. That's amazing. I, I think, you know, t tell the people about the name Jakoda and how mm. you were able to, to bring it in. <laughs> sure. Groups. I, th I think that's, there's a, a beautiful story there too. That. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so my full name is Justin Alexander Holness. So my dad being from Jamaica, Ja Rastafari is a thing. It's part of the culture. So Ja was no accident. Um, so that used to be my rap name at first. It was just Ja. And um, what ended up happening was when I moved to Ottawa, I met uh, some traditional uh, powwow singers traditional singers, drummers, etc. And I wanted to remix my music with native uh, sounds and vibrations and, and all of that. And so I ended up inviting uh, Brock Lewis, who was one of the most talented young traditional singers I've ever met. He just, he was just talented. And so I invited him into the studio and uh, we recorded a few tracks. We performed these songs at the Indigenous Summer Solstice Festival in Ottawa and got first place at the talent contest, made $5,000. We broke bread, took the rest of the money, put it back into the community to host Ottawa's first Indigenous fashion show. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening was we were hanging out at Sinbad's. I don't know if you know Sinbad's in Ottawa. But uh, it's one of the first shisha places that opened up. And I happened to get to know the, the owner there we, just because we I was there too many times. And uh, we just were hanging out, you know, just being friends, being homies and reflecting on performances we were doing. And I was like, man, I feel like my name is too short. It needs something else. And um, we're talking about it. And I ended up going to the washroom and coming back in a short period of time. And he's like, what about Jack Coda? I was like, yo, that's the one. It just resonated <laughs> fully. He's like, Ja for your dad's side and Coda not for not Coda and your mom's side. And I'm like, that's what it's going to be. So it's been Jack Coda ever since. Shout out to Brock Lewis, man. Shout out to Brock Lewis. I think it's brilliant. It's a brilliant name. And uh, yeah, I, it, it really reflects, you know, both cultures. I think it, it's, it's a good idea. For tell real. me, tell me about your new music right now. Because fast forward, I think Yo. I believe you were the first Afro Indigenous rapper to perform at the Senate. Am I mistaken? Something exactly. So, the Senate Committee on Aboriginal Peoples at the time were inviting leaders from across Canada to share their insights on reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So I was part of the first cohort of uh, people that went in to, to share about that. 
And I had no idea what I was going to talk about in front of a bunch of senators. Who am I to speak in front of a bunch of senators? I mean, my paradigm wasn't developed at that, at that capacity yet. So I'm hearing all of these incredible people share amazing insights and perspectives. So now I'm getting nervous. I'm like, what am I going to say? And so I get called up to the stand to share my part. And what blew me away, first of all, being there was my name card didn't just say Justin Holness. It said Justin Jackota Holness. And so Senator Lillian Dick was the one who, who put these name tags together. So I, I just loved that name tag. So it gave me some inspiration to remind me that I'm also an artist, to remind me of how creator touched my spirit when I first performed. So I did the same thing. I'm like, I'm just going to drop this verse. And the verse was um, a, a whole track I made called State of Emergency based on the suicides in Attawapiskat. Mm -hmm. And so that was my way of speaking my truth and telling my story and, and bringing up important topics. And so that was when, uh, you know, they basically, they're the ones who put that into the script of the, the events of the day. And when they went to share in the house, uh, you know, they, they say it out loud and I'm sitting up at the top and they're like, yeah, and Justin Jack Little Homeless made history for being the first native rapper to drop a verse in the Senate. I'm like, okay. So that's where that came from. So I've always tried to make music in regards to my indigenous experiences, uh, my rebellious side of being Afro-Indigenous. And I'm just at a time now where, you know, love is missing in this world, man. There's so much war, violence, there's so much hate, and and it's just it's 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 actually crazy to me. And so I just wanna do something positive, man. I'm trying to bring something healthy into the music industry. And so I'm about to release an album called Decolonial Love Songs. And mm -hmm. it's really highlighting, you know, the honeymoon stages of a relationship, what it's like to be on that, that date for the first time, what it feels like to fall in love with your partner, with your it person, you know, and, and do it in a way that's not degrading the woman, I got music videos that are coming out that have nothing to do with booty popping and and too much of of that derogatory kind of, you know, imagery. I'm really coming with something tasteful. I'm coming with something with respect, with with dignity. And uh, I'm excited about a man decolonial love songs album coming out in, in the month of February, where, of course, is Valentine's, you know, what I mean, amazing, yeah. amazing, yeah. perfect timing. Listen, yeah. my brother, I think this is the first of many conversations. <laughs> I appreciate you for coming here and sharing your story, which I think should be heard everywhere and uh, taking time out of your, your, your busy schedule. Take some time for me. I was, it's always a pleasure to see you. I miss you on the ball court, though. Yo, for <laughs> real, man. <laughs> I actually am playing basketball tomorrow for the first time in a while. Is that right? I was playing with the with the university. Uh, they have like intramurals, and that was fun to kind of cross up all these youngins who got big egos. <laughs> you know, it was just a good time. So I miss the basketball court too, man. So oh, man. I'll be visiting Ottawa at some point, and maybe we can hop on the court and just let shoot. me know uh, every Thursday, eight to ten. <laughs> nice, nice, perfect, perfect. Listen, man. blessings to you, man. Pleasure to see you again. Yeah. And uh, I'll be sharing your music, your information on my platform so the world can see, you know, and see the, the brilliant work that you've been doing for a very long time. So I appreciate you, bro. Yo, gratitude. And I just want to say, Ray, like, I appreciate how informed you are with your guests, you know, that the efforts you make to do the research so that when you have these dialogues, uh, you have insight. Uh, that takes somebody who is compassionate, who, you know, cares about their guests to be doing those type of things. So thank you for conducting uh, such an amazing podcast, man. I appreciate you, man, for real. Appreciate you, bro. See yes, you soon. Sir. See you soon, man. Later.